The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Modern Day Idols. I wanted to have a different title, and Jennifer changed it. (laughs) Modern Day Idols, I-D-O-L-S, Idols. I wanted to call it Idol Talk. So it's a subtitle. I-D-O-L, not Idol, I-D-L-E. All right. But before we begin, I want to just pray right now that God is about to infuse us with new strength, new vitality, new health, and new healing. So I am going to yield and welcome Jesus, my healer, to flood every cell in my physical body. I say for his lordship, health and healing is the children's bread. And I am welcoming, I am welcoming every cell in my physical body has gates and channels. And I'm saying, open ye gates, let the king of glory come on in. So I just bask in his presence and welcome Jesus the healer. Rise up with healing in his wings on the inside of me and go from head to toe and fill this temple with his health and with his healing. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Did you know that in 1 John, almost anyone that's read 1 John, you know that it's love, 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 more love, right? Have you read 1 John? It's just a beautiful love epistle. And yet at the very last sentence, he said, it's like love, 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 love. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Almost looks out of context, doesn't it? And to our Listening, it is out of context, but it wasn't in the heart of, of the Apostle John when he penned that. He was thinking in terms that love is the supreme source, and any time a step out of love is a step into sin, really, and idolatry. In other words, there's no vacancy in your life. It is either having your needs met by the love of Jesus on the inside or some substitute which we would call idolatry. And you can make an idol out of good things. That's what we call this modern day idolatry. Modern day idolatry is things that are not bad in and of themselves, but you can worship them above Jesus causes it to become idolatry, doesn't it? Take something good, but put it above Jesus and it's idolatry. So I want to cover some of those things. So little children, and we're God's children. Um, I really believe that uh, God has called Jennifer and I for such a time as this in the body of Christ to reveal a mystery in the coming move of God. I believe that much of what we're, we're telling you in essence will be displayed through many various leaders in many different ways, all based on their gifts and callings. But the truth that's going to be unfolded, which has always been in the Bible, is going to be it's going to be the truth that the mystery that is coming in the, in the coming move of God, and I'm even going to quote from a prophetic word. I believe this was from Chuck Pierce, so I'm going to give it to you verbatim. It's not the mystery of lawlessness, nor is it the mystery of iniquity, but the mystery of the hope of Jesus in you, Christ in you. Messiah in you. It's not the mystery of lawlessness. It's not the mystery of iniquity. It's the mystery of Christ in you. Now we can say we know that, but I believe that with an unfolding of revelation and an impartation of an increase in his anointing through the body at large, that's going to become a deeper nature reality, not just mental ascent. But suddenly there's going to be an awareness, my goodness, the priesthood of the believer is beginning to emerge. The day of the saints are beginning to stand on their own two feet. And all of a sudden, those that were that were in in a in an unhealthy way very dependent on other people and experts to be the source of grace to them, suddenly the grace of God is going to overflow in their lives. They're going to stand on their own two feet. They're going to be sons unto the Father. 
father, and they're going to be mothers and fathers unto sons. They're going to reproduce according to kind, and the, the real reformation of the priesthood of the believer is going to commence to operate. Full stature. God's intent was to, that you would grow up before you go up. So no matter how imminent the return of Jesus is, there's going to be a move of God to bring an acceleration by the power of the Holy Spirit to mature. No instant maturity, but an acceleration to mature. It's time to grow up. The church has been uh, like, we used to say that song. I shared this the last couple of weeks. Mighty warriors dressed for battle. A lot of times it's more like a bunch of children, toddlers in pampers with a broomstick. That's not really a mighty warrior. If you can't win the battle within, how are you going to win the battle without in the world of flesh and the devil? If you can't win the battle internally, you don't have enough anointing to blow the fuzz off a peanut. Really. <laughs> you know? It's like, it's basically what we're saying is that you have to be able to sleep in the boat before you can stand up and say, peace be still to the storms. Correct? I have never saw a frightened person rebuke something with power. If you're terrified and you rebuke, you're saying the right words, but the substance is not coming from the Jesus in you. It's coming from just repetition of stuff you've heard people say. That's when the devil says, Paul, I know, Jesus, I know, but who are you? Right? Because the source is not connected to the Jesus in you. This mystery that's going to be revealed, this is our hope. This is our song. This is our hope, and we sing it all the day long. This is our hope. This is our song, the mystery of Christ in you. We sing it all day long. There's more of God than your hands can hold. There's more of God than your mind can know. And there's more of God than your heart can apprehend. So reach out and seek more of him. You don't need deeper teaching. You need a deeper nature. We need more internal transformation. Uh, there's wonderful teachings out there about the seven mountains. How many have heard seven mountain teaching? And God basically told me to make ready a people prepared for the coming awakening. You're going to have to teach them how to conquer the seven internal mountains or they're not going to progress in the mountains where they've been assigned. Highly gifted people that are emotionally weakened because they've given place to the enemy, are not going to accomplish their destiny in the, in the full context of what God wants for you. It's not about your gifting. I've never been impressed with gifting because I've always seen that with great gifting comes great responsibility. And with that great responsibility, your character's got to match it or else you're just an accident going somewhere to happen. And I never picked that particular thing, but I can look back on near 40 years of ministry and saw that I never chose it, but God would lead to me and Jennifer highly gifted people who had emotional issues where they were shooting themselves in the foot. They loved God. They're passionate. And God clearly had gifted them for ministry, but oftentimes emotionally they would shoot themselves in the foot. If you were bought with a price and you're not your own, the thing that needs to be reintroduced into the church is that your emotions belong to God. You have no right to suppress them, stuff it. And by the way, that's not killing it. I've heard preachers talk about, well, you just got to kill it. If you don't kill it properly, most people stuff it and call it kill it. To kill it means that it has been properly presented to Jesus and the definite work of the cross and it passes through death yet lives. But it lives under the authority of the Lordship of Jesus. God doesn't want you to be emotionless as some sign of, of, of superiority. He wants those emotions to be so under the influence of the Lordship of Jesus that the fruit of the Spirit is the prevailing emotion in your heart and in your life. Your emotions were meant to be conduits for righteousness, peace, and joy to be experienced, not talked about. Experienced. Some of the most gifted people we minister to oftentimes were emotional, depressed, burned out, stressed out, and yet highly gifted. What does that say to you? If I were you and I was going for a ministry, in the olden days you might go to someone that's highly gifted. But you know what? I had a tendency to go to the ones that had victory in their life. <laughs> Have you ever gone to a depressed person who was highly gifted and said, would you pray for me? I wouldn't. I don't think that's natural. 
I would find out what is that internal anger that you're dealing with? What is it you want that you're not getting, that you're depressed? Where is the selfishness that you're bummed out? Because really, until you deal with that, you can't minister effectively to anybody else. At that point, it's all about you. Even the anger is self-inflicted. So I want to pray today that God is going to cause us to move forward in the, in the deeper nature of God so that our gifts are matched by our character. It has to start with understanding your value from the point of God. But here's the verse of Scripture. We, we've taught this in our modules, in our module training and some of the advanced training. But this is one of my, one of my favorites. And it's in Jeremiah 2. My people have committed two sins. How many know that Scripture? They have forsaken me, the fountain, and they've hewn for themselves substitutes. Idols. Substitutes is a nice word. They've hewn for themselves cisterns that can really hold no water. They leak, which means they never satisfy. If God is the source of a particular need, how many know that we have legitimate needs? Huh? God made us that way. We, 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 we need healthy relationships. We need status, possessions, hobbies, food, shopping, drugs. Well, we don't need the drugs. Sometimes you have to have some. Uh, but th those are examples of cisterns. Some of those are not bad in themselves, like possessions or hobbies. Is that bad? No. So you can, have good, you can have good cisterns and you can have bad cisterns. And some people pride themselves because their cisterns are, are socially acceptable. But I've seen people take hobbies, food, fun, shopping, and turned it into something that exalted itself above God. Agendas. I'm not really here to seek God. I'm really here to, to, to work something to work my plan, so to speak, that kind of thing. But here's, here's the place I want to start with before we even get into some of the difference between living water and cisterns. I want to start with, uh, with a friend of our, Bill Morford. I've never, the, he discovered something as a scholar and then moved on and didn't really teach much about it, I laid hold of it and I just went ballistic with it. I found a deep revelation in three verses of scripture. How many of you know Bill Morford's got the one new man Bible? Okay. Uh, he, was, he was in our church a number of years ago and uh, when we were in Columbia, uh, South Carolina. <clears throat> and it was interesting because he says, there were three scriptures in his research. Uh, for him, this was just interesting. For me, it was life-changing. He said there were three scriptures that stood out in the entire Old Testament, actually throughout the whole Bible, of double I am's. How many know that that's a Hebrew uh, teaching method that it, for emphasis, truly, truly, I am, I am. I am, I am. Well, there's something like 30-some I am, I am. Double I am's in the Bible. But there's three that he said were different. Now, what was the actual Hebrew word, Jennifer? Ani, ani. Anohi, anohi. Ani, ani is most of the time I am, I am. Most on the other 30-some examples. Ani, ani. I am, I am, and I am doubled as a, an intent to be emphasized. But he discovered three that did not say ani, ani. They said anohi, anohi. And he said, and the more he researched it, it's, it's like God was not only emphasizing it, but he was emphasizing it, ultra emphasizing it, or I think as Bill would say, he had an attitude. Okay? A positive, intense attitude. So it's like, I'm doubling, I'm doubling, I'm doubling this. So hear what I'm saying. And it, to me, it unfolded in my heart 
these three uh, double I am's unfolded as to the character. I said, I wished I would have gotten saved by those three scriptures because it would have so ministered coming from the heart of the father to a son that it would have been life changing. It still is life changing. You know what those three, you're curious now, aren't you? I'm not going to tell you what they are. No. <laughs> the three double I am's are found in Isaiah 43, 11, if you're a note taker, 43, 25, and 52, 11. There's double I am's that are unlike any of the other I am's. And you know, I live and breathe this because I took everything that Jesus said he was, Old Testament, New Testament, anything that God's character and nature had in it, I would soak in it until I had my own no-so. So I says, I am the bread of life. I know what that was. And, and the bread of life for me was not food on the table. It was Jesus giving a portion of his self to me so that I could know it intimately. But then when I found out there's three double I am's, 51.11, not 52.11, 51.11. These double I am's depicted, according to Bill, a passionate expression of emphasis toward us. All three of these are aimed at us, God's people. And he says, I am really passionate about these three things. And then I realized our entire ministry was based on these three things. Our books were based on these three things. The first one was... I am, I am your deliverer, and there is no one that can deliver you except me. So much for the many ways to God, huh? I am, I am your deliverer, a savior in some translation, but it's deliverer is the better translation. I am, I am your deliverer, and there's nobody that can set you free. So quit working an angle trying to get people to be your source. That's idolatry. God is basically saying, I and I alone am your deliverer, and there's no other way to deliverance and s salvation than through me. So much for the roads to God, right? Just think, if that was infused in us at the time of our salvation, that the God of heavens is saying that I am, I am your deliverer, that gives me hope no matter, I don't care how bad or what kind of shape my life was in, he ultimately is the only one that can get me out of that mess. As a matter of fact, even in the Lord's Prayer, that love net that came out of the mouth of Jesus, who knew where he came from and knew where he was going in that love net. Did you notice that our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, we forgive those. That, and lead us not to temptation and deliver us from evil. The farthest reach of that love net is to deliver us from evil, to draw us to himself. Did you ever see the Lord's Prayer in reverse? There's ancient ancient mystic believers. Who was that? St. Teresa of Avil? that used to pray that? Uh, she used to see it as a beautiful love net, but she said basically in principle and in life experience, it's a backward net. It's not our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy. Jesus knew where he came from, knew where he was going. That prayer went out to reach out to the uttermost parts to deliver you from the mire and the muck of your life apart from him. It's a love net that's drawing you closer to the Father. When you look at the Lord's Prayer in the reverse, you see the drawing unto himself. The love of the Father drawing children unto himself. So he is first and foremost a father, yes, but what is the cry of this father? What is he passionate about? I am, I am your deliverer, and there's nobody else can do this. So settle that once and for all, or you end up in idolatry looking for some shortcut. God said, I am your deliverer. There's nobody that can deliver you. That is the beginning stage. Self-deliverance is basically knowing that I've got the deliverer living in me, and that he can draw out of me the new creation me, and literally set me free from all, that, all of the junk. That's his goal. And if we would yield to him, he will draw. If, any, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men. So that love net wants to draw, but there's a requirement here, and we don't even use this word. Once I had a couple come to my first pastorate many, many years ago, and they were well taught. They were biblical scholars. They sat down, and they, and they listened to 400 hours of my tapes and ended up saying, that was cassette tape days, 
400 hours of tapes. And I said, so what did you hear different than what you've heard wherever you were in California? They said, you use one word that none of our preachers ever used. I said, what was that one word? Yield. It was always do. You can't do until you yield to it. Until you personalize it and own it, you can't do it. Do it, do it. You know how many people that we used to minister to that were burned out trying to do it? Religion can do that. It can drive and impel you to do when you don't even have it in you to be moved and led by the Spirit. You're driven. Religion drives. Spirit leads. As you yield to Him, it is God who is at work to will and to do. Jesus basically was there in the beginning. And in the beginning, God worked and he rested. We're supposed to rest and let him work. It is God who is at work to will and to perform. People don't understand yieldedness. They don't understand surrender. And yet those are key. Listen to the old hymns. They had it in there, didn't they? Surrender. I surrender all. I don't know why that's missing now. Now it's more hype and do. Are you ready for the second double I am? Yeah. All right. I am, I am the one who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will remember your sins no more. I am, I am, and I've got an attitude about this. <laughs> I'm the only one that can cleanse you from your sin. I am the forgiver. So it's not, oh, it's that forgiveness message. No, it's the person of God himself who is the only one that can blot out your transgressions. I am, I am your forgiver. And if you don't know him in a personal way and allow him to cleanse you of your sin, you can say all the right stuff and it doesn't work. I did it when I was a kid, when my mom would chase me. And when she chased me, I deserved being chased. I did, <laughs> Dennis the Menace. But when she chased me, I'd go, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That is not forgiveness and that is not repentance. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I don't want a beating is what that's saying. And I'm sorry I got caught. I am not repentant. Repentant is a change of heart. And did you know that there is no amount of repentance? This will blow your theology. No amount of repentance that will ever work until you forgive others. Unless you forgive, your Heavenly Father won't forgive you. It's not that he's unforgiving. It's just that it's a law. You do your part, God does his part. You don't do your part, I can't, you're, you tie his hands from doing his part. He wants to blot out your transgressions. The passion of a heavenly father toward us as believers is basically to me, his character summed up in these three scriptures. And you haven't got the third one yet. I'm going to make you wait. I am, I am your deliverer. I am the only one that can get you out of your mess. And I dwell on the inside of you under the new covenant. Secondly, I'm the only one that can forgive your sin. You can say you're sorry till the cows come home. You can even cry and repent. I've seen people at altars cry and repent. I've had people cry and repent that by discernment it wasn't even real tears. Uh -huh. Some people who are trained, they got so religious they knew how to cry at the altar. See, once you've been around long enough, you learn all these things and everybody's going, really? I don't know. You don't have to know. There's stuff you see on this end that you never see on that end. But I want you to learn on that end these things exist. There's wolves that come in in sheep's clothing to prey on the other people. I've seen it happen plenty of times. And even this, I have my friends that were Baptist pastors who didn't believe in the gifts of the Spirit had to admit that there's something inherent in a pastor with the responsibility. A God-called pastor, I don't care if he's Baptist, Methodist, what he is, if he's born again, there is an indwelt knowing of when someone could harm the sheep. Even if they don't believe they have the gift, they know it. I don't know how they reconcile, but that I've been in pastor's meetings where they say, yep, I know. I know when there's a wolf among the sheep trying to prey on the sheep. And they don't believe in the gifts, but they know that they know. That's an inherent gift on the inside. And I'm saying, my father basically says, I am, I am the one who removes, I am the forgiver. I will deliver you out of that mess, but the forgiveness has to come from me because nobody else can do it. 
Nobody else can do it for you, but the forgiver lives in you if you're born again. But when you let him forgive, it has to change to peace or it's not a supernatural transaction. Because the peace he gives is not like the world gives. So I am, I am your forgiver. And there's no one else that can blot out your transgressions. Again, so much for the many ways to God, so much for coexist. That's one of the silliest bumper stickers I've ever seen in my life. It's like, do you really think a militant Muslim is going to hang out with a Jewish person or any other Gentile? Coexist? That's kind of like Pollyanna fairy land. I, I, don't, I just don't understand it. I know where they're coming from. It's world peace. Okay. But in this world, you'll have tribulation and be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I've removed this ability to harm you. Doesn't mean you won't have it. It means I've removed this ability to harm you. I am, I am. I'll tell you what. It's through Jesus and Jesus alone that you have the forgiveness of sin. I am, I am. And I'm speaking with a passion that only God can forgive the sin. I'm your forgiver. And, he's, and we're God indwelt under the new covenant. These are Old Testament scriptures where it's the passionate heart of the Father toward us. The third one. We've got a whole book on this one. Actually, we've got a book on all of them. All three of those, technically. Self-deliverance. Um, the other two books are basically the forgiver. And the third one is peace. The supernatural power of peace or shalom. The last one says, I am, I am, I am, I am he who comforts you. And no one can comfort you like I comfort you. What does that mean? In the world we're living in, we'll take comfort in just about anything. Comfort food, drugs, medications of some sort to comfort. I've even had people engage in pornography because they say there's so much pain in my life, that's the only comfort I get. People get comfort in drugs. People get comfort in, but all of that is a false comfort, is it not? <laughs> so, I believe that the mystery that's coming in the next move of God is going to be it's going to be the Messiah, Jesus, in you, the hope of glory. And when I say the hope of glory, hope is in God, not in a particular outcome. Do you know I've seen more Christians get sabotaged because they put their hope in an outcome that they fabricated. You do not fabricate the outcome. Your hope is in him. And hope does not disappoint. When you tell God how he has to do it, you basically are setting yourself up for disappointment. You shut down. Hope disappoints. Hope doesn't disappoint. Hope deferred will disappoint. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. All right. Are we ready? Are we ready for ministry yet? That was the prelude. Jeremiah 2 says that his people have committed two sins. First, they have forsaken God, the fountain of living water, and they've made for themselves broken cisterns that can hold no water. Basically substitutes. Substitutes of their own making. That's a bad deal. That's like trading in your brand new Mercedes Benz. Wish I had one of them. Brand new Mercedes Benz for a junkyard car that has no engine. My people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they've hewn for themselves broken cisterns that can't even hold stagnant water. It's not fresh. It's not clear. It's not running. And God's basically saying he's making a fresh stream, but man has a tendency to take a cistern. And that led me to understand something, that God's supply is unlimited. So let's, let's just uh, do this from uh, something that Jennifer taught me as a psychologist. I don't hold to a lot that psychology teaches, but I did like reality therapy. I kind of fell in love with reality. Reality therapy is just kind of a, 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 a carnal way of saying, 
So, uh, what you're doing over and over and over again, is it working? <laughs> oh, so do you think that if you just kept doing it over and over again, that someday it's going to work? Uh, and would you like, if that plan's not working, would you like another plan? And then, of course, we go, the other plan is Jesus in you, the hope of glory. So, I looked at it and I said, if, uh, if we basically have needs, legitimate needs that God made, he, he made us to, to have need peace, value, right? You need these things, security. Those things are not bad. He made us to need those things, but he expected us to have those needs met in him out of our relationship in him. To the degree that we do not have those needs met by our relationship in him, there's no vacuum. You have found a substitute to give it to you. So whether it's value, peace, security, um, any actually any of those things, uh, What would replace getting it directly from God? That would be an idol. The idols would be, here's an example of some cisterns. Try harder. Have you ever done that one? When things weren't working, you just tried harder and it got worse? That would be a sign that God wasn't in it, that you were doing it in your own strength. Burnout. God's not in burnout. If you burned out, it's your willpower. Unhealthy relationships. Anybody ever get into unhealthy relationship? Don't, don't nod your head now because you can get in trouble. Does anybody ever get in unhealthy relationships? <laughs> We're going to assume everyone's in a healthy relationship right now. Unhealthy relationships. Seriously. Do you know that that unhealthy relationship was, there was something in you that has never been satisfied properly, and so you found an unhealthy way to get that need met. That's idolatry. There's no voids in anybody's life. You fill it with God or a substitute. How about status? How about possessions? Collectors? Is it wrong to collect things? No, but it could possibly be saying there's something in me that I need and that is feeding it. Well, we're going to get guilty of all these things, right? And then we're going to get forgiveness for the guilt, real or imagined. <laughs> Food. I think my mom used to do that one. Oh, Dennis, you don't feel bad here. Have a cupcake. <laughs> hmm? Comfort, food, right? Don't tell me people don't do these things. Shopping. Find out when you shop. I mean, obviously, there's a necessity to these things like eating, and you, you go to the store to shop to get the food to eat, unless you're killing it in your backyard or something. <laughs> but ultimately... Ultimately, it's feeding a need. Have you ever been bummed out and then do a certain activity? What is the activity you do when you're bummed out? Because it's approaching clearly idolatry. You're not getting that need met by God. You're filling it with something else. Hmm? Ladies, I'll pick on the ladies. Any of you get, any of you get depressed, bummed out, and so you go shopping? Hmm? <laughs> Anybody get bummed out so they purposely don't go shopping? All right, I don't know. But you know, you know what these are. Uh, it can be religious traditions. It can be finances. I used, to, I used to hear testimonies from men that would always tell me how they're trusting God, but then if there was a problem on the job front, I've watched them literally fall apart, almost lose their salvation over losing a job. Losing a job is a serious thing, but not to lose your salvation over. So I said, you know what? Their security was in the job more than it was in God. Their identity was more in the job than it was in God. And so that brings us to basically the other one that I see that's real current is vacation, travel, and entertainment. Are those things bad? 
No, but I've watched people deviate from their devotion to God for entertainment, travel, excitement. Actually, secular therapists recommend for people with personality disorders like histrionics, it's like a hysterical personality type, to, in order to get that energy out of them, go do skydiving, go do something wild and reckless to get that out of your system. Otherwise, you have a tendency to turn all that energy on destroying people. How many, ever, how many remember that old program, Sonny and Cher? Do you remember that? Did you remember what she did to him? That the skits were basically put downs? I read an article where that was, um, that was natural to her. As a matter of fact, she was taught to go skydiving, weightlifting, because that her personality, how true this is, I don't know, it was in an article. Her personality was histrionic, which is an exaggeration of a person. A histrionic or an exaggerated personality type would be, if you'd say mother, they would be smother mother. If you said dress pretty, they would dress like a prostitute. They would be an exaggeration in life over what the, we would call the norm. Always over the top in expression. A walking exaggeration. An embellishment of whatever they were trying to portray. And they would say, she would pick on Sonny and the little skits, but that was easy for her because it came natural. In the church, we, what would we call it? We'd call it Jezebel, all right, in the church. But in reality, there is that type of personality both in the church and outside of the church. It's an exaggerated uh, trying too hard to depict something. And basically, they could tear in the people, so the secular realm only had one solution. Go wear yourself out. Go do weightlifting, which she did. Go do skydiving. Go do this. Go do that. Get that out of your system so that you don't turn it on people. That's a pretty poor substitute, isn't it? I'd rather say go to my I am, I am, the one that forgives your sin. Turn to me and get that stuff out of you. Let me be Lord of your life instead of you because you're not doing a very good job of it. All right? So here's, here's the contrast. I want you to see just how, how much this is in contrast that this was almost tongue in cheek when this was written in the scriptures. This was like saying, he, you have turned down living water to drink out of a bird bath. It was meant to be that yucky and extreme when they talked about a broken cistern. It was meant to be like you chose that over a living stream of healthy, flowing water. My people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, the fountain. They don't go to me as the source for their need. They go to a substitute that really doesn't satisfy. And actually, here, here's four elements of the difference between the fountain of living water and the broken cistern. Number one, the fountain is a free gift and it's available. That in itself says it's foolish not to go there. That we are God indwelt. And that fountain, if anyone comes unto me, he, can, he will drink and never thirst again because that's going to be living water and it's going to spring up like a fountain within them. Go to that fountain or require the hard work that that other thing requires. What would you rather do? Go to the free gift or work real hard at it? That's when you see religion click over in people's life. You ever seen people burned out on religion? They wanted to come across as holy, but basically they got worn out. That's a cistern. The free gift is to be led by the Spirit, not driven by the Spirit. The fountain is forever flowing. In this contrast, in Jeremiah 2, the, the, the contrast was that the living water is ever flowing and it never runs dry, right? We know that in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. This river never runs dry and it's available at all times. The other one's unreliable. The other one's maybe there's something in it and maybe there's not. You can't depend on it. 
How many, as a matter of fact, one of the ways I used to minister to people in my first pastorate is I could tell when someone had a meltdown, usually their cistern broke. Think about it. When's the last time you had a meltdown? Whenever, <laughs> don't raise your hand. <laughs> you people on Ustream, if you ever had a meltdown, when you had a meltdown, your cistern broke. God didn't break. Living water doesn't have you cause you a meltdown. If you had a meltdown, there was something you were trusting in more than God, and your meltdown was suddenly you don't have it anymore. It's like taking uh, candy away from a baby, you're going to cry, right? When's the last time you had a meltdown? Let's watch these Ustream people. When's the last time you had a meltdown? Whatever that was that caused you to have that meltdown, something was taken away, something was no longer available, something broke, but your dependency on it rose to the surface. You manifested. And now we say, what do we say, Jennifer? Manifestation is good because it tells you you've got an issue there that needs to be brought to the cross. And it's like John Wimber used to say in the old days when they'd have a big meeting and somebody manifested demonically in the midst of them. He'd say, now the question is, is it coming or going? <laughs> so manifestation is good, providing that you apply the anointing to get it to go. I thought that was... I thought that was very perceptive of him. I mean, he was moving into all these charismatic, prophetic things, and it was all new to him. So he just analyzed, mm, I see that person's demonically manifesting. Is it coming or is it going? Oh, that's a legitimate question, isn't it? But manifestation is good if you apply a redemptive process to it. Otherwise, it's not good in and of itself. All right. The... other aspect that is so important, when I try to teach people to use their discernment, the difference is in the fountain. When it's God, you always feel clean. I've, I've even ministered to this with people with sexual issues. The, the people that are caught up in sexual issues cannot tell the difference between love and lust because they both feel good. So I'm going if they've already been engaged and are confused in that area between love and lust because they both feel good, then I says you've got to approach it from a more discernment point of view. If they have Jesus in them, say, is it clean or unclean? And instantly they can make a distinction. I've never seen that fail. If you're watching by Ustream, try it. If you're not sure whether that boyfriend of yours, if there is in a seductive uh, spiritual, sexual soul tie, whether you've engaged in inappropriate behavior or not, which almost is non-existent nowadays, even in the church, um, that's your free part, just in case you think I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and the question is, does it feel clean or unclean? Don't go, does it feel like love? Because everybody, they love, lust, they all lump it together. Have you ever watched Bachelor, Bachelorette program? We did that one season, didn't we? And we did it for the purpose of this, being totally astounded at how people were attracted to the bad boy and the bad girl, regardless of the quality, apparent character qualities of the other people. And I've said, that's the way of the world. And that's the way your life is going to go. You will always be connected to the wrong people until you let God do it. Until you let God do it, I promise you, you'll be connected to the wrong people. I promise you, you will be. And it'll be the devil. The time that I dealt with that man who had strong sexual issues and he was single. And he was from state of Ohio. And then I dealt with a married woman whose husband was unsafe. She had sexual issues and didn't want to deal with it. I thought it was interesting. In one week, I had two people that didn't want to deal with it. She wanted to keep it, thinking it was going to help her win her husband. I don't know how she figured. I know how she figured. But I went to a Christian banquet of 400 people, and these two strangers walked in the room and went, and started up a conversation. Do you think God put those two together? 
they probably really felt united. But that's a seducing spirit that draws together. If even on those television programs, I know they're unsaved people, but even on those television programs, the mother and your best friend says, stay away from her, she's the bad girl. If your unsaved mother and best friend say, watch out for them, why was that the one that they went for? Then to show you, it shows you the depravity of the heart and that there is a law that is bigger than your common sense. So don't think you've got this rational reason why two people are together. You don't have a rational reason. A seducing spirit puts you together. And if you could see a seducing spirit, I'll tell you what, you get cleaned up real fast. I can remember a girl that could literally, worked in a factory that could literally arouse men just by her presence. And externally, she was extremely homely. Not that that matters in this world, but you know what? Not when it's the love of God, but when it's sex sins. I was shocked at how successful she was with men. And she was almost like right out of the Bible. She had been married five times. And she was still out on the prowl. And she was really quite homely. That's what sexual spirits could do. But I says, but what the Lord showed me was it wasn't what she appeared to be like. It was like if I opened the eyes and people saw the demonic seducing spirits and what they looked like, they'd get clean real quick. They'd get clean real quick. And that doesn't matter whether she's a beauty queen or homely or anything in between. It makes no difference. If you could see the spirit, you'd be disgusted. That's when God even taught me that in dealing with love and lust among young people, don't even try because they can't separate it out. They're confused. And if they drop down to their spirit and they feel confusion right there, God's not the author of confusion. And right down here, say, is it clean or unclean? All right. So we're going to have to get our source from the fountain, aren't we? Where it's fresh and clean. The other one is stagnant and dirty. If you really opened your heart up and said, all of that shopping I do when I'm mad at my husband. Sounds like I'm picking on the ladies. If you drop down to your spirit and you felt that you would feel anger, hostility, resentment, that's unclean. Why not just acknowledge that it's unclean? That it's some form of retaliation. It's stagnant, it's dirty, it's a cistern. And the other contrast is that when it's the living water, it is fully satisfying. Even in a marriage, in the marriage there is a union that is satisfying better than any sexual act that you ever had when you were single and living in sin. Or when you were married living in sin. There is a union and a communion that satisfies within the marriage bed where the glory of God is included in it that is far more satisfying. The other one never satisfies. Look at the world. Look at it in the sexual arena in the world. They have to keep getting weirder and weirder because what used to satisfy doesn't any longer. Right? And your brain is made to change according to those likes and loves. That's scary because we see it right before us in a society where people's brains are changing. It has nothing to do with their value system. Their value system is changing as their brain changes. And the weirder they get, the weirder things get. Are you ready to get some ministry? Don't raise your hand. But here's what we're going to do. First of all, we're going to identify cisterns in your life. We're going to get an attitude of prayer. And the easiest way is, well, yeah, you can slip up your hand because this will help people. It will help you. How many can identify a cistern? You can actually see it. That's good. All right. If you can't, if it's not obvious, if you don't see something that you go to other than God, if it's not that obvious, Let's ask God to show us how many are game for that. How many are willing? Because when he searches the heart, he won't play games. He'll put his finger where it needs to go. Do you, how many want to? You really want God to search your heart? Okay. 
Because in your head, you can know conscious things. But when God searches the heart, he goes for the non-conscious. So Father, right now, in the name of the Lord, I am God indwelt. I am a new creation that loves you and you love me. And I am welcoming and allowing you to search my heart. And if you're watching by Ustream, you just allow God to search your heart and say, God, is there anything that's coming between what you and I have together? Is there anything, anything Is there anything that I'm trusting in or needing that I need it, that if it suddenly was removed from me, I would have a meltdown? Anything that rises up, fear, any relationship, that if that relationship, I'm speaking to single people now, any relationship that if it was removed, I would feel like it was killing me. Because you're supposed to be knit together by the Holy Spirit. You're not to be tied in an unhealthy way to anybody. Are you ready? Nod your head if you have something. God showed you something to depend on. Then let's welcome the forgiver in us. Welcome the deliverer in us to deliver us from that. We receive forgiveness for having given an attachment to that. I receive forgiveness as a gift to cleanse me and sever that attachment to that person, place, or thing. I receive forgiveness for that attachment. Now, whatever that need that it fulfilled, I offer my heart, my body, a living sacrifice. That's all of me. I'm offering that part of me to God. I belong to God who will supply all of my need according to his riches and glory. And it's Jesus in me, the hope of glory. And he really will supply all of my need. I need him more than I need that. It might not be a sinful thing in and of itself, but I need him more than I need that. I am reconnecting to the fountain of living water as to be the source. He's going to be the source of my security. He's a source of my value. He's my affirmation. He's my acceptance. He's my refuge. He's my value. He's my worth. He's my father. He is first above any person, place, or thing. I relinquish that other thing to God for him to carry it away. If it's, if it's a good thing in and of itself, then I'm believing for God to just rise up with his strength in me for moderation. If it's evil, I want to be separated from it totally and completely and the tie be broken. My emotions belong to God, not to that. Wherever there is a cistern, there's an emotional attachment. I'm receiving forgiveness for being emotionally attached to some person, place, or thing more than God. It could be finances, it could be relationships, it could be... I receive forgiveness for being emotionally attached to anything other than God. Now 
of the test on the inside for the priesthood of the believer is that it feels clean inside. No guilt, no shame. I receive the cleansing by the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside. I am what I am by the grace of God. I am wanted and accepted in the beloved. I feel clean. I feel clean. That tells me I've reconnected to the fountain of living water. Thank you, Lord, that this is a day of exchange, a day of cleansing of the heart, a day of removing the idols from my heart, that I will find my sustenance in you. Right. Thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, is that an exercise you could do on your own in your prayer time, from time to time? Especially when you have, you're really upset about not getting something? or something falling apart. The thing I recommend is the way the Lord taught me to deal with this stuff, especially in light of the seven mountain teachings. He showed me to welcome his presence in the seven internal mountains. That means I want him to rule over my spirit. His thoughts are higher than mine. His choices are better than mine. His emotions the fruit of the Spirit are better than mine, and plus I don't want to grieve, quench, or resist Him in any way. All my possessions, including your gifts and talents, and all my relationships, and my physical body to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. If He rules over those seven internal realms, you are a candidate to approach any of the seven mountains and be successful in Jesus. You win the battle within before you enter the battle without. And so God wants to begin a good work in you, continue that good work in you, and empower you for the marketplace. My first pastorate, you can see pictures in there. I had everybody equipped for in the building. Everybody was active doing flags, sign, dance, something. There was hardly anybody participating. I mean, not participating. They were all participating. And God says, now, when we planted this church, now I want that same emphasis to be totally equipped for when they go outside the door in the marketplace, because that's where 90% of them are. No matter how well you equip them inside a building, ultimately, you've got to live 90% of your life out there, more than that. Therefore, be equipped to know how to enter into a volatile environment and triumph victoriously because you've conquered the seven internal mountains on the inside. You're going to be powerful in those mountains. This is the day of the saints, the day of the priesthood of the believer, not the day of Joe Heavy Speaker. Although I am Joe Heavy Speaker today. <laughs> I was assigned by God. <laughs> but you be Joe Heavy Speaker in your jurisdiction. That's the goal. Wherever God's placed you. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit 